My name is uh, Conrad Haber, and I was a, started as a systems engineer here in uh, June 23, 1969, and uh, worked with, at the time it was uh, Government Communication Systems Division, GCSD. And the uh, reason for coming here was because uh, of all the space work that RCA had done with the Ranger series and all the moon uh, pictures and photographic work. So once Apollo started up, this was the place to come and work. So I made sure I got down here and came in on a rotational program and ended up getting an assignment up with Ed Nossen up in the communication systems area. And Ed was doing uh, a lot of the Apollo work. So I was in the perfect place at the right time uh, to get on in on that. Keep going. Okay. Um, so let's talk about your first assignment. Right. And, um, you know, what you had mentors, uh, what your impressions were, why you came to RCA. Yeah, I think the primary reason for coming was uh, the space race was at its height. And as a technical person, I mean, that was the place to be. I looked at what was going on. I couldn't get into NASA. They were in iron. So uh, I decided the next best place was to come uh, to a company that's providing all the hardware uh, for, the, uh, for the space effort. And that was RCA, was a significant supplier. Uh, came here, and uh, the group was phenomenal. The people here, uh, you know, uh, Ed Nossen, who was, I ended up working for, who did a lot of work on coming up with some very creative solutions to solve navigation problems and communication problems on the space, day, on the space program, in particular between the Apollo and the LEM and other things. And um, I had uh, people like uh, John Allen and Carl Solomon to work with, who were senior engineers and were exceptional people in terms of uh, bringing along a, a young engineer and inviting me to meetings and uh, just watching how these people think and solve problems was was an incredible learning experience. It's one thing to read about problem solutions in textbooks, but another thing to sit next to some really experienced people and watch how they frame a problem, things they pay attention to, things they don't pay attention to as an engineer and understand how to really solve the, the key parts of the of the problem and come up with a solution rather quickly that's effective enough to get the design going that you can't learn in a book. And these guys were great at doing it. So I was very fortunate to be around three or four exceptional people and I got learned as much as I could from them. And how did they treat you? It was interesting. I mean, I felt uh, rather intimidated as a student. Uh, you know, I had all this knowledge in, in my head and I thought that was important to remember equations and all the things that I had learned. And uh, I figured these guys were, you know, weren't even going to recognize me, but they treated me as, uh, as a peer. Uh, they explained things to me. Uh, no question was too stupid to ask. And slowly I became comfortable with saying, I don't understand that. Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? And uh, there was nothing I'd ask that they wouldn't, they wouldn't answer. And if they couldn't answer it, or if they did answer it, they'd give me some references where to go uh, look, look further. This was pre-internet, so you just didn't go Google this stuff. I mean, you had to go to the library and do some research to, to look this stuff up. So having somebody there who could actually explain things to you was way more valuable than it is in these days where you can go Google and tap into experts who have written things in, in different documents and, you know, via your iPad, you can get all this stuff. It was a different world back then. So what was your contribution? Uh, I, I thought I really wasn't going to have much of a contribution be, being so young. I, I figured I'd just learn all this stuff. But the interesting thing was uh, something that it turned out to be very significant to them was I would check all the calculations on the uh, radio communication links from in space. So that we RCA built uh, a, a um, the LEM and not the LEM but the lunar rover, which had on it a video transmitter and and would send pictures directly back to Earth. Okay, and there was an, it was a transmitter and an RF link, and somebody analyzed how much power was necessary to get a good signal quality on the ground. And this was pre-calculator; everything was done with slide rules, so everybody was using slide rules to do these calculations. And uh, I looked at the documents and uh, I went through them, and was trying to understand how you do these calculations with the very complex waveforms they had, and did the math, and looked like I found a mistake. You know, so I checked it ten times and looked like a mistake. So it looked like they weren't transmitting enough power to get the picture quality you know, on the ground. So I went to, uh, to Frank Hartson, who was one of the guys I was working with, and got his attention and said, uh, Frank, it looks like you guys are not 
transmit enough power. He says, yeah, okay, okay. He said, I'll check it out, I'll check it out. Well, about two days later, he called me in and, and he was all happy. He said, you know, there was a mistake. It was four watts too low. He said, and that would have degraded the picture quality on the ground, he says, which would have been a disaster because that stuff was getting piped all over the world from the moon. So actually, I found that problem. <laughs> so I was pretty proud of that. And that was one of the things I did. You know, I wasn't here even a year and found that out. It's pretty cool. Get, getting some, you know, congrats from some of these really high powered guys I had a lot of respect for uh, was an incredible experience. Yeah, really. Did you do the calculations the same way they did? Well, they just, they just put, yeah, they, they had the equation, and they said, you know, here's the equation that defines the loss, and if you put in uh, this power, you know, it all works out. And I said, well, my slide rule is the only way you can do it. There were no calculators. Nobody had any, there was zero calculators. That technology was not invented yet. So I, you, you go through with the slide, and if you're familiar with the slide rule, which I'm sure <laughs> most people aren't, I mean, you have to take care of decimal places in your head, and uh, all that has to be done in your head as, you, as you're moving the slide rule. And there's a lot of calculations, so it's very easy to make a mistake. And uh, I checked it, like I said, 10 times, and uh, it, was, it was off. It was wrong. So I was, they, it was a big deal to them, and then it became a big deal to me. So it was a very good experience. Talking to uh, some of the other people involved with Apollo, uh, there's a story developing about the rendezvous radar and that maybe it was either less than adequate or maybe it needed a backup. Do you have anything you can yeah. add to that? Yeah, the rendezvous radar was critical, I mean, because what the radar permitted was when the LEM took off from the lunar surface after landing, it had to re-rendezvous with the command service module and the command module, which, was, which were orbiting the Earth, or orbiting the Moon. And the primary way that the LEM could find these spacecraft was to use the rendezvous radar. But NASA's design philosophy was that any systems that are critical to life support, like life support itself or, or radar like this, because if those guys couldn't find the command module to get back, they were done. They were dead. They don't have one system. They always had two systems at least, backup. So while the rendezvous radar was the primary system, they ended up using the ranging system that Ed Nossen developed, we developed here in Camden. Ed, Ed was the one to use the communication radios as a way to get range and range rate and sort of help you steer and find the command module if the LEM rendezvous radar was not working. So that Ed's system got high priority and had to be working and on every launch to make sure that if that radar failed, we had a backup. And in fact, uh, that system worked so well that when we did the Apollo Soyuz transfer experiment where uh, the Apollo spacecraft and the Soyuz spacecraft actually docked together back in I think 75 or so in orbit, uh, the Russians used our ranging system to find the docking module, which was pretty cool. And we gave them, you know, the schematics and stuff and so because you have to build a transponder and uh, they don't have any semiconductors, they only had tubes, so we actually built it for them and got it installed on, on Soyuz, which was really cool. And that was the primary system for doing the rendezvous, and it worked really well. I mean, they docked up and it was cool. We're, we're all familiar with Apollo 13, mm -hmm. but it sounds to me like you may have actually experienced that time. Yeah, this was part of the... Uh, the learning process of being part of what's going on and sitting in the room and listening to all the, the real uh, movers and shakers solve problems. 13, we built the command radios, all the command radios for the 13 mod, for all the Apollo modules. So uh, what happened was we got a call from NASA and they said, hey, have you guys ever figured out what would happen to your radios if we powered them down and they had condensing water on them? Would they power up and operate again? So we said, what? <laughs> and they said, for real. So the next thing I knew, there was a phone call, tele uh, conference call, all the guys in the room, and you know, I snuck in the door and sat in the back of the room and watched this thing unfold. And basically what they were, they described the problem, and they asked us, you know, we got we to gotta power down the command module. And because when we do that, with the uh, water vapor in the air, it's going to condense out 
when we fire up, your radio's got to work or we can't, we can't communicate with these guys. Have you ever tested it that way? No, we need you to test it. Go. So guys went off, we took them in the environmental lab, you know, put them under the humidity, got them into condensing moisture. I mean, I wasn't doing any of this. I was just watching this unfold. It was incredible. And, you know, yeah, they worked. So the guys got back and we closed with NASA and, and there was a, it was a lot, a lot of fury here. We're working like through the night, just running on this thing 24 seven to get this question answered. And uh, it was an amazing time. And our radios, we said they would work and they worked. When, when the guys powered up that command module, those radios were on and they had grounds with, you know, com with Capcom on the ground. Worked really good, good stuff. I didn't design any of those. I wasn't, I can't take any credit for all of that. But it was great being a technical person, just being around guys who did and watching this whole thing unfold. Now, how does your career get from there to where you are now as a staff system engineer? I think I, I, the funny thing about engineering is that technology changes rapidly. And as we all know, you know, even faster, it's, it, it, it's geometric with time. But... The thing that is invariant with time are the underlying, underlying physical principles under which devices work. The approach to solving problems, which you can't learn in a book. And those lessons, once you learn them, really, really transfer nicely to the newer technologies as they come through. The terminology changes, the technology changes, but at the heart of all this are the same physical principles. And when you have problems, the way you solve these problems are the same as, as I learned back then. So, Everything I was fortunate enough to learn uh, in school and from the people I worked with who mentored me here has transferred over the 46 years to now. And I can still sit in a room with guys who are half my age and we can solve problems together and I can participate and, uh, and get solutions. And that's an incredible feeling to be able to do that. Even though, you know, when I came into work here, we were transitioning from tubes to semiconductors. And as everybody knows now, most people don't even know what a transistor is anymore. I mean, there's just flat packs and integrated circuits and the technologies so far advanced from anything we could have imagined back then. The physics is the same. The math is the same. And how you solve a problem, pretty much the same. And those are the things that I think I, I, I really value uh, having learned uh, here in my early part of my career. So are you now mentoring engineers? Yes. As many as I can, get young folks in here, and um, uh, I just give them a, I just dump everything on them. I mean, I give them what I got, uh, as much as they can stand, because I'm not going to be here very much longer. And um, some guys, you know, check out early. Other guys can take it in. And the thing that's really great about a lot of the young folks that come in now is, which I didn't have, they'll go off, and I'll. I'll give them a dump on some RF stuff and how you solve a problem in communications. They'll take notes and they'll go off and they'll look at the words, things they don't understand. They'll go on Google, they'll, keyword, they'll do keyword searches, they'll get articles, they'll read them. In one night, they can do all this. And they come back with me with follow-up questions the next day and they say, hey, I read this paper, I read this paper. Back in, the, in 69 and when I came here, that would have taken weeks to research. Do it real fast. So I can get through a lot of guys now. So I've got about three guys that I'm working with. They're very bright and very interested. And uh, as long as you have the interest, you can take advantage of the fabulous technology that's out there now to learn things. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Let's uh, talk about your RCA co-workers. Uh, it was intimidating. Um, uh, guys like Ed Nossen, who were, you know, I mean, it's like 40 patents and just about a, a genius in, in terms of doing things, um, but still would take the time to interact with me and look at my stuff and tell, he's, he wasn't a very um, uh, talkative person, but he would pay attention and give me some guidance. There were guys here like uh, other people, like Jim Feller, who were, uh, had not only great technical capabilities, but had photographic memories. I could remember every detail about everything they'd ever seen. And uh, they were phenomenal people uh, working and, you know, you could interact with them as well. Um, and there were some very talented designers here who, who were very capable of using the existing technology to build circuits and radios that worked phenomenally. Like, um, like Sam Petrofitter was the one who worked on the command module radio. 
that was before I came here, back in the late 60s. I came in 69, but I had a chance to work with Sam a lot on some other RF programs after that. Uh, so that we had a mix of what I called uh, very conceptual people who could deal with the mathematics and the concepts, and then we had some very, very good technologists who could build things. And getting those groups together was very powerful. If you had, and we had talented people in every one of those groups, made some fantastic products, and responded to problems very quickly. What about your supervisors? Did uh, they value your work? Um, yeah, for the most part, they did. I, I, I noticed uh, no one ever discouraged me. No one. Everyone took the time to to look at what I did. A lot of times when I saw how my task fit into what was going on in the program, it really wasn't significant, and a lot of what they did was, was. But they looked at it, I think, as a learning experience for me, you know, something to learn. But no one ever said, no one ever dismissed anything no, as being trivial, not correct, or no one made me, uh, made me feel uh, inadequate in any way. We were always encouraged to learn more and to do things. And only when I could see what happened at the end, I could say, gee, that, that piece of work wasn't going to make it anyway. But I, I wouldn't have known it from when I got reviewed. People. So did you feel that RCA valued your work? Yes. This place was a, was a technical company. And it was run by engineers. Uh, and ta engineering talent, technical skills were valued very highly. That may have been the demise of this place in terms of its business uh, modeling and, and be able, being able to be competitive into the future. But as an engineer, this was a phenomenal place to work back then. I mean, we were working on programs critical to the space race, the defense of the country, with really competent people. And, you know, we, got, we had good contracts. We had the funding here to do things, and we did them. We learned a lot. We've heard from a lot of people a uh, term, the RCA family. What's that mean to you? Uh, I've never worked any place else. I've ca I came here for uh, about five years. I was going to get out of school, get some experience, and then move on, you know, get to another environment. Uh, I'm still here. Um, it's not RC anymore, and it's changing. It's changing. But there's still remnants of the culture uh, back then. When you came here, uh, this wasn't a job. This was a career. Uh, the people that you interacted with, were, it wasn't a sterile interaction. It was uh, an interaction that was almost like a family. I mean, you had people who, who were concerned about how you were feeling, how you were growing um, technically, and how you were supporting the overall organization. And there was a lot of concern about that here. And they were concerned about bringing people in. And people took care of people. Uh, even people who were key contributors and for some reason were a little off their game, uh, these people were part of the family and were assigned places where they could still produce, still be productive, and still come to work. I think uh, in a modern company that was a little more draconian, uh, those people might have been laid off, discharged, and you know, what have you done for me lately kind of attitude. There was not much of that back then. When you did something significant, and there were people who did very significant things in this company, uh, the family took care of you. Because you had made a key contribution, uh, you were a valuable person, and yeah, maybe you changed now, you're a little different in the kind of things you can do, but sort of we owe you. I mean, you're part of this family, we owe you. And, uh, you know, we're going to find a place here where you can still be productive. I don't see that in companies now. I don't see that attitude toward people anymore. It's more, uh, yeah, you did that great thing, but, you know, you got paid for it, and now what are you doing for me? And... That wasn't the way it was. It was truly like a family, like, like you treat your siblings or your parents. I mean, uh, you know, through good times and bad, that was your family, and you stuck together. And that was really how it was here. So therefore, instead of staying here for five years, I'm here for, for most of my career, all my career, for that reason. I mean, that, that's a layer that makes it really nice to come to work. I mean, you, you have that relationship with the people, technical challenge, um, and get paid for it. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, I, I don't think so. What about outside of work? Oh, uh, how do you mean? What would I... Well, um, did you associate with any, any of your co-workers outside of yeah. work? Um, yeah, there, engineers, uh, there's a wide spectrum of personalities in engineering. I mean, there's a traditional engineering personality, very introverted, quiet, you know, kind of nerdy. And we had those kind of guys. And I was sort of like that back at the beginning of my career. Uh, I mean, that's sort of the kind of folks that got attracted to engineering school. But there were other people here who had totally different personalities. 
And uh, like John Allen was somebody that I was fortunate enough to work with who turned out to be, uh, was a senior scientist here at the end of his career in Camden. But he was in that systems group with me. And John was a very excellent engineer, very gregarious guy. He had like a Christmas party every year, which he invited me and my wife to the first time we were here. This is incredible. I mean, you know, I work with these people, and I'm going to be invited to this, this social event with them. So not only was John there, but all the people I worked with were there. And I saw everybody in a totally different venue. I mean, this was a have fun kind of environment. It wasn't technical. And uh, people were bringing in dishes they had made. And, uh, and this happened every year. And every year that John was working here, and even after he left, uh, till he passed away, we went to a party every year with him. Well, my wife and I, we went to every party. So those kind of things were really special. Um, and uh, of course, traveling with these guys on trips, when we'd go on these trips, they'd bring me along just to observe and to see how things were going. Uh, incredible experience watching how these people, just the discussions, we talk about world affairs. I mean, these were multifaceted, really rich people uh, from a human standpoint. They had a lot of facets to their personality and being exposed to that was, was a great experience. I had a lot of that. These guys were all great. That was a great environment. It's part of the family thing where you, you get to see all the facets of somebody and you can have a much better relationship with, one, with them when you know who they are. Yeah, we've also heard from people about uh, lunch hour and Christmas Eve and things like that. What was that like for you? <laughs> yeah, Christmas Eve here was a, uh, was, a, was a day you wanted to come into work, but you weren't going to be doing any work. Uh, there, were, um, there were parties. Uh, people would have celebrations. Uh, John Allen, every, for the systems group, every Christmas Eve, he would have a poetry reading session in the conference room where he would start reading, and I forget, it was uh, somebody from, it was a poet about, uh, I can't think of the name of it now, about the North, about the North Country and, and uh, being in the Arctic. And, and so he would, he would read these poems, and we'd be all in there. There'd be soda and food and snacks, and we'd be going on doing that. Uh, there'd be a lot of discussions and just having a good time. Every Christmas Eve, that, that's how it went. So we worked for a couple hours and spent the rest of the day in here with the rest of the family, so to speak, uh, having a good time. Um, we've also heard from people about RCA's influence on South Jersey. Do you have any anything to say about that? Well, I think this is RCA was RCA and Campbell Soup were South Jersey. I mean, everybody in this area that I ever met either worked at one of those two places or knew somebody who did, uh, or had a family member that that was here. Um, this there was when both plants were here. There were a lot of restaurants and support places and stores. Camden changed a lot since then that supported all the people here. It was a lot of business that we provided them. And um, anytime I, people ask me where I work, if I say RCA, then they know exactly they want to know where, who you work with, uh, you know, that, that kind of discussion. So you know that they either knew somebody here, had worked here themselves, or had a family member that did. And it was, just seemed like South Jersey was either Campbell's or RCA. I was surprised. I came from New York City when I went to school and came down here. Southern New Jersey I knew nothing about, but it was pretty clear that uh, those were two big companies. All right, so how would you sum up your time here at RCA, your career? Um, how would you sum that up? I would say it was a, um, a great personal experience in terms of meeting some incredibly fine people. Uh, I, it was a intellectually stimulating and rewarding experience in that I got a chance to, to really grow uh, technically, but more importantly, work on some programs that really had an impact on the world. Uh, space and some of the other areas I've worked on uh, in the classified arena, which I got a chance to see what the impact of those was. And um, that is very fulfilling. It was very fulfilling to me. I'm still working now. Um, you know, it's been 46 years, and uh, wouldn't be doing that if I didn't still feel it was something really special. I'm going to have to change that now. But um, I, I look back, and uh, it was a great ride. I really, really enjoyed, it. and I hope that you know engineers that start now, and and I know that corporate environments changed. There's still a lot of a lot of problems to solve out there. I hope they end up uh, you know with the same experience that I have because it was I couldn't define it in, in a better way. Well, I know you to be one of the 
best systems engineers I've ever encountered. And Thanks, I Jim. hope your time here isn't too short yet because uh, you are critically needed in what you're doing. Yeah, I enjoy it. And it's, it's good. And the young people are incredible. These young folks coming out of college now are uh, very, very talented guys. So that's encouraging, too. It's great working with them. So.